So we did find some evidence for these adhesions at our fascial laboratory in Ulm University. When you skin an animal and you look at the semi-transparent superficial fascia here, you see that most of the layers, but not all of them, follow with the skin, with the dermis to the right, but one layer stays below on top of the fascia profunda. And that's usually like a double back sliding on itself where you have the, the biggest shear happening. And what we found is that in some animals, in some places, you find adhesions right at that sliding layer between the lowest two membranous layers of superficial fascia. And uh, in our experience as Rolfus, we find uh, a, um, an, uh, a lack of slidability, usually over, over dysfunctional muscles or dysfunctional tissues more often there. For example, like behind C7 in people who have a dowager's hump, it's very difficult to take the skin and move it in different directions. And interesting enough, these adhesions seem to develop around the neurovascular bundles, which are also to exiting exactly through that double layer of the lowest two layer of the superficial fascia. So here you see the raw thing, how it actually looks like. This is from Art Ricks, from one of his teaching videos, Sir Rolfer. So you see it's very slow. And I'm often trying to distract the shoulder, so I'm now pulling this humerus out as I'm working here. And there's a little bit of tightness right back here. So if I want to get a little bit of a stretch to that area, I can just bring her arm over. And now I'm stretching this. So he touches his left arm a little also. bit. I noticed Dina had a little bit of protective um, uh, bracing against that. So whenever that happens, I want to move them back into an area that they feel safe with, and then from there increase that again. So now I've worked on that a little bit, and I can start pulling her arm across again. Remember, I can ask for active movement and have her reach across, and that's going to actually inhibit those external rotators as she moves across there so that they're going to let go and lengthen. That's a typical elbow. Eideroff was known as Mrs. Elbow. Schroeder's posterior is a really good muscle group to work on here. Just work with the breath here. So the client is meeting him from the inside. Precise and measured pressure releases tension and restrictions. That's from Clusen Not and only Rossmann. The superficial layers are treated, but also the deep layers. Rolfing can be done lying on a massage table, in sitting, and even in standing upright. During the session, there are times when active movement participation of the client is required. During your treatment, you are likely to discover holding patterns. There have been a few studies published in peer-reviewed journals. They demonstrate a shift in pelvic inclination, a better muscular orchestration according to EMG, and a shift towards a parasympathetic tone together or not together and independently also a lower state trait anxiety. Recently we focused with biomechanical modeling to figure out if the forces that we apply, 100 Newton and more, are sufficient to yield a pure viscoelastic deformation in fascia. And they came to the conclusion, yes, probably we can affect that uh, level with thin fascia, but not so likely with thick fascia. So when we think we feel a release at the fascia lata, for example, it's either a palpatory illusion or it may be something else besides a pure viscoelastic deformation of fascia. Let me close with these three questions to the scientists. First of all, do you have any explanation why we think that the shear angle gets, is much more powerful than longitudinal or orthogonal? Second one is uh, any comments that we get these strong parasympathetic shifts with that slow melting pressure? And finally, what do you think is the most responsive tissue layer to the manipulation that you have seen here? Thank you very much.